Yeah, good afternoon. Oop. Muy buenas tardes, damas y caballeros. Espero que les haya gustado la comida y les doy bienvenidas en esta sesión tan interesante sobre las cadenas de bloque y su papel en la inclusión financiera. Me llamo um, Al Baghdadi, Haider Al Baghdadi. Um, voy a ser el moderador de la sesión de hoy. Represento Jadet. Y antes de trabajar con Jadet, eh, estuve trabajando con AFI eh, unos años y siempre me es muy grato volver al Foro Político Global. Eh, y creo que se trata de un tópico, sobre todo después de la comida, es un tópico interesante pero complicado. Eh, nosotros... Honestamente, uh, preparándonos para la sesión, uh, gastamos bastantes esfuerzos. Yo estuve leyendo muchos periódicos, uh, vi varios videos en YouTube para entender la esencia de la tecnología de cadena de bloques y uh, hice todo eso para esa sesión. Para muchos de nosotros es un tema muy nuevo y no es fácil de entenderlo porque es un uh, tópico de uh, tecnologías informáticas y uh, necesitamos tener claro cuál es el potencial de la tecnología de cadena de bloques, cómo podemos utilizarlo para la inclusión financiera. Además, tenemos que ver los riesgos relacionados con esta tecnología, no solo el potencial. What are the use cases that are currently discussed regarding financial inclusion? Um, one topic is definitely payment and cross-border remittances, um, especially with regard to cross-border remittances. Uh, there seems to be huge potential. I um, just want to recall uh, the SDGs, uh, which calls for reducing the cost of international remittances to 3% by 2030. At the moment, uh, the costs for international returns are at 7%. And we see, if we look at cryptocurrencies, that some of the providers of cryptocurrencies, they offer international remittances with zero costs. So there's huge potential for bringing down the cost of international remittances. Same is due also for payments, uh, maybe to a lesser extent, um, but we will hear more about it from the case of South Africa. Um, another use case, um, Apart from, uh, apart from international remittances, is identity, um, providing people with a legal identity. Maybe also just to recall um, that there are more than a billion people worldwide, especially women and also children in rural areas, but also refugees, they don't have a legal entity. So and there are no approaches to provide people uh, with legal identities empowered by blockchains. There are many startups working on that topic, and it seems to be promising um, because the nature of a blockchain and distributed ledger is that the information it stores or records on a, on a, on a file, on a blockchain, it's almost immutable. So people have an immutable um, identity, uh, which can be very, very beneficial for people without identity. Another uh, use case is uh, on land registry. Uh, you're also aware that uh, many people uh, on a global scale, don't have, uh, uh, they, have um, um, they have land, but they don't, uh, it's, it's not really registered. And there are also many approaches like Estonia, for example, and Sweden. I think they are front runners to uh, provide um, legal uh, registry um, for, for people who don't have a legal entity. Um, so these are the different use cases. And today we will not talk about uh, land registry, we'll focus on international remittances, payments, uh, and also on ID. But we also have a very interesting approach coming from, from Southeast Asia, from Cambodia. They even go beyond. Um, they want to provide uh, a cryptocurrency, its own cryptocurrency in Cambodia. I think this is very, very interesting. But having said that, I want to stop here with my introduction. And uh, I want to introduce you to the first uh, speaker today. Um, one moment, sorry. Her Excellency, oh, here it is. <laughs> sorry. Her Excellency Deputy Governor uh, Shipika, 
uh, from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. She will give a scene setting presentation. She will give an introduction what blockchain is about, uh, what are the potential, what are the risks, and she will also refer to the specific uh, Zimbabwean uh, case. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as the, theme, the moderator has said, my task is just to do the theme setting. Uh, but I want to start by thanking Afi. I think those of you who know the case of Zimbabwe, we have been in, in the international community kind of like an orphan for the past 20 years. It is really now that we are back on the international scene to play our part. And as you see me putting on this familiar international scarf, those who have been watching international news, we are saying Zimbabwe is back and we are open for business. So before we talk blockchain, we first talk Zimbabwe is open for business. <clears throat> but I also want to say, as I am setting this uh, important theme in technology for financial inclusion, I'm not uh, an IT expert. I am actually a development economist. But in the Central Bank of Zimbabwe, I oversee the financial inclusion program. Because as a development economist, I have been working with these groups for the past 30 years. All these marginalized groups and arguing for broad-based inclusive economies. And it has taken for me three decades to finally see something happening. That makes me excited. When I prepared the presentation, as a non-technical person, which I think is good, because sometimes when we just hear blockchain, we close our ears. We are afraid what it is all about. So it's good that it's being presented by a non-technical person, the way I understood it, to demystify it. Hopefully everyone else can, can relate to it. So let's uh, move in this uh, theme setting presentation. <coughs> My first slide, people may not be able to read, I'm also not able to read from here, but I'll use my hard copy. I just said, whatever the case, we need to first define a, a bit what this blockchain technology is all about. And I'm saying a blockchain is a, it's a specific type of distributed ledger technology. And for, for though the IT people, they know what we are talking about. And a method of organizing data in aggregated ordered blocks that are chained together by a cryptographic hash function, which really just helps the cryptographic hash function, helps to translate the information into some hidden form. We know even if you are non-IT. But I also noticed that this uh, blockchain technology, it's a recent innovation, probably starting around 2009, it's an innovative and a disruptive innovation that eliminates the need for trust and middlemen. And that is really part of the challenge for us regulators, myself coming from the central bank. Because I think part of the historical reason which keeps on coming in all our presentations here at AFI is that really this technology came partly as a response to the global financial crisis where people and players are saying, regulators, you let us down, and we lost money globally. So it's like, kind of like, if I, if I talk in Zimbabwean language, it's like a protest vote from the innovators. Regulators, you let us down, now we are innovating something where you will not be needed. That's why largely it eliminates trust. We were trusted as regulators, but didn't, things didn't go well. But all the same, we have to find a way forward with that technology, find its place instead of uh, ignoring it. And I purposely said, the, for this presentation, a blockchain technology, I know it's largely linked to cryptocurrencies, but we don't want this presentation to deteriorate into cryptocurrency arguments. We want to look at blockchain technology as a technology available to help us in many ways apart from cryptocurrencies so that we open up and see 
its potential in financial inclusion. Blockchain is a disintermediating technology that eliminates friction in value exchange over the internet. So it's kind of like self-regulation. And in that uh, next slide, I just um, tried to simplify, particularly for us, uh, the non-technical people, what is happening in, under this technology. If you look at the top, if we read the slide from the top, transaction A, which is me putting my data into the system, transaction B, C, and D. And then it's translated by that hash, crypto, whatever, encrypting, into hash value A, hash value B, hash value C, hash value D. Then we are now grouped together until if you look at the bottom, we are now a combined block, block 50, which I called block 50, which is now the combination of combined hash value A, B, C, D. We are already a group. And then we are again linked to a similar group before that, which I called block 49, by another hash block, and, and so on. So huge data sets can actually be linked under this technology without even a regulator in it or a middle person, okay? So basically to me, I said the, one of the key advantages of this process is its fast processing power of big data sets that we were probably failing to handle up to now. So when you look, for example, at some of the potential of the, the technology, it can work in insurance, in business, in tax, in all over both private and public applications where we were really having big data handling problems. So that's how I, I understood it in simple form. Next slide, we, I just said, Let's track where we are coming from so that we, we have the comfort of accepting this latest um, technology. If people definitely, we all remember that uh, we were moving from the dialing phone, that telephone, the old telephone. When we came to the mobile revolution and we started seeing the cell phone coming on board, when it came, it, it was wow. But no one ever thought that the cell phone would become our bank like it is now. So my middle picture there is now showing us, talking about mobile banking, doing our things, the bank is now in our pocket. It was totally unforeseen. And things are moving very fast. We are seeing now beyond uh, DFS, your mobile banking, your internet payments, the blockchain technology is the next phase. So we cannot afford to be left behind. And we are saying for that reason, let's move with the technology. Because financial inclusion may even be moving faster than what we are experiencing now. So to me, it's a technology revolution. This uh, slide, I was basically looking at, so that we can link the potential of this technology, I said, what are the barriers that we are currently facing? Just reminding you, you know this. At the moment, we are complaining about affordability of financial products and services, lack of robust, very verifiable ID systems. These have been continuously mentioned in this workshop. Deficient payment and credit infrastructures, incomplete secured transaction frameworks and collateral issues impact of de-risking, especially on international remittances. And we are saying, with these challenges, what are the potentials, potential solutions that can come from blockchain technology? We are saying there is high potential in handling the cross-border payments. Even digital identity systems can be handled under this technology. Asset registers that are terribly problematic in all the developing and emerging economies. Digital currencies, we need to give them a chance instead of just dismissing them as central banks and policymakers. It is one thing to, to dismiss digital currencies. It's another thing to say, let's try it probably under a regulator. Then we will be giving the technology a chance. 
and things can move forward much better. Then, uh, something not coming through there. Let me see if I double click. Uh -uh. We, we were just, it was really just, I think it's the colors, but it's a world map where we were just alerting you that a lot is happening on all the continents, from the Canadas to South America to where we are, to Africa, to China, to Australia. Things are happening of a blockchain nature, but still in the form of sandboxes, Others called their trials projects. Others called them accelerators. Others are calling them innovation hubs. But whatever the name it may carry in your country or on your continent, there is some opening up and warming up to this technology. Because people are seeing its potential. And we are saying, let's not be left behind. He, in this slide, I just tried to look in brief. I'm sure the other participants will be talking about these risks and so on. I highlighted the setup costs. I remember a few months ago, I was in Germany, and we were taken to one of these um, scientific innovation hubs where blockchain technology was also being uh, explored. And we were surprised that we were told that the cost of generating a Bitcoin was actually higher than the value of the Bitcoin in itself. And we said, wow, so what are we talking about? So setup costs can be very high. Cyber security, which is continuously coming up. The issue of regulation. How do we then link what we already have to what is coming on board? And here the challenge is that normally innovation is moving faster than us, the regulators. So it's like regulation is following behind innovation. We, we, it is a challenge. Then um, I also thought that uh, another practical challenge for us is we have systems, systems that are already working, DFA systems and so on. How do we integrate those legacy systems now with the new high-tech blockchain technology coming on board. Uh -huh. I'm nearly there. On this graph, uh, we just thought that we would also take advantage to tell you a little bit what is happening in Zimbabwe in relation to the use of technology for financial inclusion. And basically, what the graphs are telling us is again the high increase in the use of mobile payment subscribers. That's where we are making our greatest mileage in terms of financial inclusion. Just almost statistics close to what the governor of Kenya gave us. Where about 80% of the transactions in the country in volume terms are happening on mobile. And that is the equivalent in value terms about 25%, a quarter of our transactions in Zimbabwe. But what, it is, what that data is showing us is that um, many of our transactions are on mobile, but they are small transactions. That's why they constitute 25%, which to us is financial inclusion. These are small people, small, micro, small and medium enterprises, rural people, women, the youth who are making these small transactions, and they are being financially included. My last slide, so where do we go? What do we do with this new technology on board? As regulators, as policy makers, I gave three scenarios of the poss possible reactions, and some of these are happening in some countries. In my first slide, I am saying we can be like the ostrich and hide our head under the sand and pretend that things are not happening on the technology front and therefore do nothing about it. That won't work. We, we really have to quickly move from that mode. Then in the middle picture there, the Cox fighting, it is also a possible reaction from the regulators and policy makers. Oh, these people are disturbing our terrain. We start fighting innovation. We start fighting technology. It doesn't help. It's here. It's here to stay and it's moving very fast. And we are saying, 
our last picture there with the beds is probably how we should receive blockchain technology. Listen, learn, and then regulate to make sure that things don't collapse and somebody is responsible. Otherwise, it's an in innovation world. Thank you. Yeah, dear Excellency Shibaka, thank you very much uh, for this very insightful uh, introduction. I mean, you had to, uh, into the topic of blockchain. You had the incredible task <laughs> to explain to us in 10 minutes uh, what are blockchains. That's why we gave you 50 minutes, because it's a very hard task. Uh, I think the last picture is a very nice transition, um, the picture with the, <laughs> with the hen. And, uh, so uh, when we come to the, to the next presentation, the next use case, uh, we come to Cambodia, um, I would add another uh, bird, I would say, another hen or chicken that is flying, because it goes even beyond <laughs> regulation, and uh, we will learn now why. So I have the pleasure to introduce you to Her Excellency Deputy Governor Nef Shantana. Uh, Ms. Shantana is a member of uh, the Central Bank's board and a chair of the uh, Supervision and Regulatory uh, um, um, Council. And she's also the chair of the Financial Stability Committee within the Central Bank. She's also a member of the Security and Exchange Commission uh, of Cambodia's Security Exchange Commission. So please welcome our next speaker. This one there, okay. And this one. Right. Okay, um, you have heard about the usefulness of the blockchain. So what the Central Bank of Cambodia or the National Bank of Cambodia is doing is looking at the blockchain and to improve our payment system. Hopefully with this blockchain, we'll be able to increase our inclusive to the remote areas. And especially, since Cambodia is a dollarized country, we're using the blockchain to improve the use of local currency. So we're going to use it and um, hopefully to be able to issue digital currency in local currency. So I'm, I'm gonna show you how, how we're going to do it. The slide is so small, but you can see how we got into partnership with a, um, a Japanese um, company, Soramitsu, to create a hyperledger called Irowa for new payment infrastructure. And this payment infrastructure will enable us to go further. So the next slide um, is, um, this is the benefit. Why are we doing it? Why are we doing it? What's the benefit of this um, blockchain technology? So um, it's a hyper, hyper ledger under control, validation. There's only permitted and limited nodes to be um, in operation. And the validation time is fast in a few seconds. And it's a medium of exchange, acceptance, and low cost. And also, the password key needs to be attached to it. Account can be recovered by the central bank and KYC requirement and multi policy. We can control the money supplies. So why we are doing this project? It's the name of the project. We call it Bakong Project. The project, as I mentioned, Cambodia is a cash economy. So um, all claim can be claimed on a central bank. So this um, digital currency, you can claim on a central bank, not like other cryptocurrency. This is, this, uh, this is a means of exchange. It's a unit of payment which fit into the definition of um, currency notes. It's just a replacement of note only. So um, for financial inclusion, it will expand access to financial services, expand the channels to distribution, low fee for end user, and low investment cost for participants. So the advantage of the technology, as Cambodia have a lot of young generation, 70% of our population are young, in between um, 30, in between um, less than um, 50 years old, down to 18 years old, so 70% of us are young, young population, and um, payment demand are secure, fast, and convenient, and with a very minimal fee. 
The role of the central bank in the payment, we are an operator, we own the central bank system, we also a regulator, so we can regulate and oversee the payment services provider and payment system. On the, minute, on the policy maker, multi policy in financial state stability, that we require to conduct a further study on it. So what can the Bakong project do? What can the project do? We promote the use of electronic. So there's increased use of electronic, and we collect physical cash into the system. The demand on the physical cash may reduce, provide an advanced payment infrastructure. Cash can be deposited, loaned with the financial institution, and financial institution may play the role as a KYC agent distributing the channels and promote the ecosystem. There's no interest on the central bank digital currency, so financial institutions may attract other financial institutions' products and services with that price. So how does it work? To us, the financial institution can join this project we call participants. And each participant needs to register at the central bank in order to obtain a permission to join the network. And after successfully register with, with our project, the participant can top up money to their Bakong settlement account. Participants can send money to each other via this project on a desktop application. Each participant can create address accounts for its customer, the users. And participants are responsible in managing their customers' accounts, including KYC. So if you look at the, um, the graph, I've showed the graph, um, you can see that this actual project of a blockchain that we're using would be able to send, send money to each other, pay any bill or transfer fund, deposit, allow customers to deposit money to any bank account, and receive for showing the QR, we use the QR code to sender, option including amounts and roughly. And you can see the, the, the pink, the purple color, the purple color there, the purple color is the central bank, and we have the central bank there, and then we have the gateway, and down below, I can see the pointer is a, I look the pointer down below, you can see bank A or bank B or any banks. And our MDI um, is the microfinance deposit taking institution <laughs> and also the payment service provider. They all is a gateway for us and each of, each, each of them will have a core banking within themselves and then they connect it to the central bank. So they are, they are the agent for us to um, distribute the um, digital currency So next, um, we will, um, this is only a pilot case that we're working on it. So there is a legal that we have to look at it, how to supervise it, how to oversize it, what sort of regulation that we should have in place to validate that. And also, since it's a mean of payment, there's always related to financial stability. So when financial inclusion expand and increase, this could be, we had to balance between financial stability and financial inclusion. And monetary policy, it will be a different kind of monetary policy. You know the money best, but you don't know how to multiply effect with this digital um, currency since the speed is so fast. And then there's other cyber crime. We need to have a secure system to be um, interoperability and um, hopefully we would be able to use this blockchain to improve our mean of payments and also to sort of de-dollarize, use more local currency. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Your Excellency, Deputy Governor Shantana, thank you very much for that really excellent presentation and also congratulations to your approach. And I think we all stay tuned to see what the results will be. You are still in the planning phase, as I understood, and you will roll out um, this technology soon. 
and I hope that next year you can then come back and report on the progress. Um, I mean, what is really remarkable also when it comes to international remittances that, uh, I mean, to bring down the costs, the reason why that financial intermediaries are excluded, no? And, uh, I mean, they're not actually needed anymore, financial intermediaries, when it comes at least to international remittances. How, before we go on to the next presentation, uh, I would like to ask you, how do you see the role of uh, financial institutions in that setup? Uh, okay, um, you see, uh, some our colleague mentioned that we could bypass the financial institution, but to us, we thought that perhaps in the future, we may bypass the, the intermediary in between. But for the starting, because we are concentrate on retail, on retail first, just to, um, uh, to expand the use of local, to promote the use of local currency, then we would use the financial institution as our immediate channel to distribute the currency. Just at the moment, uh, your note, you, you um, issue your note, you issue it to the public. So through this uh, blockchain or through the financial institution, then they can have more innovation to produce a products that fit to it and for the user. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think now we can come to the next use case, identity. I said it in my introduction, there are different use cases for financial inclusion. Here we have an example of another AFI member. And I would like to invite uh, the next panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Ellison Piddick, Assistant Governor responsible for financial system stability uh, at the Bank uh, of Papua New Guinea. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aida. Okay, so I want to tell you a story about what we are doing in... Uh, in Papua New Guinea. Um, by way of background, just to appreciate, uh, Papua New Guinea is in the Pacific. Uh, it's one of the largest islands in the world. There are approximately 8 million people there. Uh, and 75% of the population do not have a bank account. We have a very exciting national strategy we are running now. Uh, the second one, uh, which by 2020 we should see the number coming right down. There are over 800 unique languages in Papua New Guinea, uh, and only 18% of the population live in the urban centers. So as you can imagine, the bulk of the population is in the rural areas. 20% uh, of the population have access to electricity, internet connectivity is not really reliable. Uh, but, but amazingly, 75% of the population, they uh, have access to a mobile phone, and they can do SMS messaging and uh, communicate with their relatives in other places. I think that's a good starting point to start a story. Uh, so why blockchain? Um, we... We, uh, we are looking for solutions. Our goal is to reach the uh, unbanked population. And, uh, and as a regulator, uh, we, we need to understand the benefits of blockchain. We believe that blockchain works, but we want to know. We are quite curious whether blockchain can uh, provide uh, benefits that are far superior than the existing database systems that we are uh, regulating in our jurisdictions. We also believe that ignorance is not the basis of good governance. So I'm talking to all good regulators in this room. Uh, we need to see the trends and developments, and I think there's a good presentation, presentations we've heard now. And we need to begin to understand the issues and potential pitfalls. Uh, we need to provide thought leadership as central bankers. I think we need to be ahead of the game. And we have to, open, to be open and be flexible in our attitudes towards adopting new technologies. I think that's the uh, name of our game that we've been talking about uh, for a good part of the week this week. And, and I think and I believe we can leapfrog mature economies. Uh, and I'm talking to us, uh, those developing Economies with a large population that are either unbanked and living in the rural areas.
So again, uh, we, our objective is to, to find a technology that can enable us to reach our population. And I mentioned um, that can provide a cost-effective means, reliable, secure, enable interconnectedness and transparency, and of course, enable us to, to improve our KYC uh, with the AML CFT uh, issues and regulations that are really, really uh, uh, getting in the way in terms of uh, we are experiencing in the Pacific the issues of de-risking and how we can uh, meet those challenges. So in terms of enabling us uh, to develop a system, maybe an identification system that we can use, uh, and the banks and the uh, financial service providers uh, can use, and even government can use for their G2P programs, and so forth. So we've started on a journey and uh, our journey started uh, in, in September 2016. Pardon me about the uh, quality of the uh, smallness of the slides. In 2017, January, we, we attended a London hackathon and also a conference. And we raised our need area. And that is if someone in the room can develop a blockchain program that can meet our need to reach out to our rural areas where there is no electricity. Um, basically, the population is, uh, to a large extent, illiterate. Something simple and something that can be used. And so, thank goodness, we got a, what we call a Papuani box that was developed right there within a few hours. And so the journey, we went home and talked about it. Uh, the Australian government uh, picked up the story and we got a visit from uh, the Prime Minister of Australia to PNG. They are also interested in the idea. So this is good, good collaboration. And so we have now started a good collaboration with the uh, Australian government. We ran uh, a number of uh, uh, trials to, in terms of concept, proof of concept, one in the urban center and one in the rural area. And I'll show you a few pictures later on. I'm just going through the slides, as you can see. So we, we managed to do the proof of concept, and they seem to work. This is quite exciting. And so we ran a blockchain conference, get everybody, synthesize the ECU, and get every, all the thinking into the issue. We, we've just set up an association, uh, which uh, now will enhance collaboration between uh, government and the private sector. So there is now broad discussions in, uh, in, in the country. So you can see the journey is quite a, a number of events so far we've, uh, we've done. And in 2018, we, our focus now is to uh, develop a, an identity trust framework. I think that's create an environment that uh, blockchain can run on and, uh, and we can be able to uh, get the trust of people as well. And uh, to look at, uh, uh, also the other, the other uh, deliverable we want to look at is uh, sandboxing, the idea. And, and so we've got a number of issues that we want to do this year. So this is a picture of uh, a village, very remote place in PNG, uh, just outside the capital city. No electricity. A telephone, uh, there are, there you can access telephones, which is quite good, especially mobile phones. You can use them in these areas. Uh, and so uh, there was a, so we did a trial. Um, <clears throat> quite interesting. So it worked. We used that Papuani box, now we're calling it ID box, that, uh, where a person can provide his or her fingerprint. Uh, it has a fingerprint reader 
There is a, an SMS SIM card number. You can enter it into the, the ID box, and it's combined with some encryption of it. We just heard about the encryption. Um, and uh, there is a, then uh, we, by just using a solar, a solar kit, you can be able to run this in a very remote place. So we think that uh, this, this thing can work in the rural areas a blockchain uh, system to enable uh, financial inclusion. So that's a picture of uh, the kit that we are using. Very simple, and, uh, and uh, someone can use uh, that to make phone calls, to access values, uh, to buy uh, a good or something uh, by use of uh, this simple uh, uh, ID box. So these are some of the key features <coughs> in terms of security. These are some of the key features, or three main key features of this ID box or ID card. So it has, it has the capability of storage uh, and storing a cryptocurrency type barcode, very long one. Um, and that's generated by the, the machine. And uh, so and you, can, you, can use, you can use your ID. Uh, in the rural areas, people don't really keep a lot of their, you know, yeah, a passbook can get lost, a uh, card, a debit card or credit card, you know, they can lose all these things. I think it's, this, this thing is so ideal. You buy use of uh, biometrics, uh, you can. Uh, you don't need to remember where you kept your card at the last time you use it. You just turn up with your your fingerprint, so long as no, no, no one cut your finger off. And um, and then all your features can uh, come up on the screen, and and your identification can be uh, can be done right there. It is quite interesting. So that's the uh, journey where we have. Uh, just one more slide. It's not there now. The lessons learned. So what are the lessons that we have learned now? Well, there is a need for consistent communication uh, throughout this period that we are running this, uh, this thing. There's a lot of awareness that we need to do, a lot of financial literacy programs that we need to carry out. Uh, people <clears throat> need to understand uh, so there is something that we need to do. Firstly, we need to work with the, the villages, get their permission. So there are cultural issues that are quite uh, important that we need to uh, be aware of and, and uh, explain what we are trying to do that will help them to improve their standard of living. Um, so, and, uh, and so there are uh, so we need to focus on the outcome, the benefits, and not on the uh, technology itself. Technology, we think it, it can work. Oh, so we need to focus on, on what benefits, the outcome that uh, uh, the customer can derive out of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Pidik. That was a very interesting presentation. And we have learned about another use case, identity. And I think it really um, yeah, is a good example uh, how um, ID wallets can be used in the future. And uh, it also shows it needs commitment from the government, from the central bank, to share information, to also endorse information, and to accept the information. I think this is very important to have that in mind that government commitment is needed when it comes to blockchain technology. Um, last but not least, uh, we want to come to the, uh, to the next use case of payments. Um, I said in between that financial institutions are not needed apparently, but here in South Africa we have an interesting case. Uh, we did already a test run, risk banks. That was very successful, what I learned, and uh, so I would like to introduce you to the next panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Jeanette uh, Tamblanche uh, from the Reserve Bank of South Africa. Um, uh, Ms. Temblanche is, uh, is the head of uh, policy, uh, statistics, and industry support department. And uh, prior to um, her uh, work at the central bank, she worked in the industry 
uh, at various positions at CEO levels uh, for insurance companies and also banks. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to repeat what the other speakers have said before, but I want to tell you about what we did in South Africa. We've got a um, project, Project Corka, and the first phase of it was very successful. Um, we've got 11 official languages in South Africa, one of which is Isizulu, and um, the word Corka in Isizulu means pay. So it's Project Pay if you translate it to English. So I'm going to focus on Project Corka. So what we've got in South Africa is, um, f for the first time ever, we've got the Financial Sector Regulation Act, which establishes the Twin Peaks um, system of financial regulation. So we've got the Prudential Authority as well as the Conduct Authority in South Africa. But within the enabling piece of legislation, the Financial Sector Regulation Act, we have got a specific mandate for financial inclusion. Linked to that, the South African Reserve Bank then established a fintech unit. So within our fintech unit, and this is what you've got on the slide, um, is we've got three distinct um, focus areas for now, and the number three on that slide is then specifically focusing on Project Corka or running a blockchain, blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology test case in the payment system environment. So what we do um, in terms of financial inclusion and using financial technology is we've got innovation hubs, regulatory sandboxes, and innovation facilitators in our um, uh, uh, fintech unit within the South African Reserve Bank. Project Corka specifically, our goal was to contribute to the global initiatives which assess the application and the use cases for blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. So Project Corka was an exciting collaborative effort between a consortium of banks in South Africa as well as technical and support partners, and it was led by the South African Reserve Bank, um, by the Saab, as we are called, um, and our fintech unit. The goal of the project was to build a proof of concept um, on a wholesale payment system for interbank settlements using a tokenized South African brand on, it, on this technology. So the project started in January 2018, that was the first phase, and it ran for 14 weeks. The project was designed to provide a realistic test of a DLT-based wholesale payment system. Note that I continuously say wholesale payment, it wasn't retail payments yet. So we also investigated whether confidentiality could be achieved at scale, and whether production volume, production level volumes and multiple no node types, each configured by the individual banks, could be accommodated. And the result was that it could be accommodated. So the scope of the project was to create a distributed ledger between these participating banks as a wholesale payment system. And it was backed by central bank deposits. It allowed participating banks to pledge, redeem, and track balances on the tokenized RAND on the ledger. The project aimed to assess the performance, scalability, privacy, and resilience of a DLT solution under conditions that were as realistic as, as possible. possible, in that each bank was responsible for its own node and the Project Corka endeavors to satisfy the requirements focused on operational environments, and it also looks at the principles for financial market infrastructures. So whilst doing this test case, we continuously looked at whether we are compliant with international standards on the PFMI side. So by way of example, the settlement finality, um, which is achieved by the interbank um, transactions and the consensus mechanism in terms of which it is not possible to revoke transactions, In South Africa, we on the 9th of March of 1998. This system is our automated interbank settlement system, and it's provided by ourselves to the banks in order to settle their obligations on an immediate, real-time basis in central bank money. It operates on a 24-7-365 basis and was designed to settle all large value wholesale and securities transactions as well as the interbank obligations resulting from 
retail payment clearing houses. Large volume payments are settled individually on a real-time gross settlement basis, while retail payments are settled as a batch on a deferred basis. The SOMO system is linked to the various participating banks, clearing systems and our operators. Participants in the settlement network include the, the Reserve Bank, our commercial banks, registered branches of foreign institutions, mutual banks, and cooperative banks and designated settlement systems. Just to point out that cooperative banks in South Africa, some of your jurisdictions might be calling them credit unions. SOMOS is the only RTGS system in South Africa and it is owned and managed by ourselves. So if you look at the orange graph on the slide, the values that pass through the SOMOS system are those orange, uh, on the orange line are the wholesale or large value payments. That's about 90% of the daily value that happens in real time through SOMOS. That's about 300 billion rand on average daily, which to South Africans is a lot of money. <laughs> the grey graph at the bottom of the slide. Le bout de slide uh, show, uh, vous montre les ventes de gros, le, les volumes de ventes de gros, les valeurs actuelles. C'est incroyablement uh, haut niveau. Les valeurs qui euh, est part de ce système est, est essentiel pour l'infrastructure et l'économie de notre pays. Euh, quelques défis que nous avons euh, rencontrés, c'était euh, des, des défis DLT. Dans ce, cas, dans ce cas particulier. Dans le tailleur et l'efficacité, euh, les documents que nous avons développés euh, euh, ont l'information des exigences, exigences euh, de, euh, de base et le projet et le dessin a été basé sur les cloud technologies et des machines virtuelles. Et une des preuves des concepts a été inclus, inclus dans, ce, dans, ce, dans son papier. En conclusion, la fonctionnalité du système DLT et en conformité avec les uh, paiements uh, en gros. Et um, on va développer ça dans notre pays. Uh, C'est tout pour, pour le moment de ma part. Merci bien d'avoir partagé uh, votre expérience de, cas, de ce cas particulier. Il y a beaucoup de membres d'AFI uh, que je voudrais uh, engager dans la discussion. Uh, et vous, je voudrais vous, uh, vous engager uh, dans, la, dans, dans le procès d'inclusion, de, uh, de, de, uh, de, de vous inclure dans le, dans le process bo 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 uh, blockchain. Uh, J'espère que nous ne, ne uh, résistons pas à uh, cette technologie et... Uh, Merci pour votre euh, euh, présentation et je voudrais euh, donner l'opportunité, euh, des chances pour les questions de, de, de notre spectateur. De nos spectateurs, il y a des, y a-t-il des questions euh, Une question courte pour le représentant des Cambodge. On n'a pas compris la question. Euh, a, pourquoi Quels sont les stimulus, les, les stimules pour la participation des euh, institutions ré, régulatrices Les consommateurs ayant des comptes avec la, la banque centrale pour commencement 
ils veulent ils veulent nous euh, participer et et, et euh, traditionnellement euh, ils sont euh, euh, ils, ils euh, se sont confortables euh, par euh, recevant des des, euh, des monnaies physiques et euh, en s'adaptant à, 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 à un système nouveau et quelque chose euh, de nouveauté pour eux. Et euh, la conscience de ces sociétés n'est pas là, euh, n'est pas là encore. L'argent électronique numérique. Euh, sans, euh, sans engagement du de, de de système de, de la banque centrale, sans la, la, cette connexion avec la publique, sans euh, l'information euh, que nous pourrons euh, leur fournir, c'est impossible. J'ai une question pour le représentant de Papouasie-Nouvelle-Guinée. Je, je sais que le Cambodge et Nouvelle-Guinée utilisent euh, les dollars. Les économies, les frog euh, ce sont les deux économies que euh, je connais et ils sont capables de, euh, trans de, de, ce, de ce transfert à blockchain parce que leur monnaie dépend des, euh, des effets des, des, euh, de, 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 de l'économie de, de dollars. Euh, et que, quel est le, le, le tarif d'échange euh, entre les dollars et les, les monnaies de Papouasie-Nouvelle-Guinée et euh, les, cette technologie peut, peut aider beaucoup euh, aux, aux, euh, aux économies euh, développantes, de, de, développantes. Euh, euh, je ne sais pas si j'ai compris votre question mais euh, répétez votre question s'il vous plaît dans le contexte d'inclusion financière de, pour améliorer la, la productivité de, de l'économie euh, comment euh, votre, cette euh, technologie peut-elle peut, peut euh, être utilisée nous avons une grande proportion de, une, grand, une grande part de notre population qui n'ont pas d'accès aux, aux services euh, bancaires du tout. Et le moment qu'on les connecte, les lie au, au système financier, on peut euh, avant à, à bénéficier des euh, services bancaires et financiers de suite et ça va élever le niveau de productivité euh, immédiatement et nous le savons par notre expérience il y a une, une connexion directe euh, dans le cadre de euh, l'inclusion financière et l'améliorement du de, de bien-être qui concerne les tarifs d'échange, euh, les dollars sont les, les monnaies de réserve dans euh, la majorité des transactions. Et, et, et comment ça se passe euh, euh, au Cambodge les, euh, les, les transactions avec euh, Bitcoin euh, sont interdite 
c'est euh, pourquoi notre économie est euh, dollarisée. Euh, en fonction de productivité, par utilisant des, euh, les crypto-monnaies euh, pour nous, nous pourrions euh, nous avancer beaucoup euh, dans le contexte, dans le sens de, de l'inclusion financière. Parce que ce n'est pas monnaie, euh, c'est pas la monnaie physique non plus. Et, mais la crypto-monnaie peuvent devenir euh, moyen de paiement. Et euh, ceux qui reçoivent euh, le, les paiements peuvent le faire par utilisant les QR codes. C'est euh, très simple. Et nous commençons à voir les effets de ce système, de, des avantages de ce système, indépendant de, de l'état de, euh, de l'économie euh, nationale, euh, par évitant le, la phase de dollarisation de notre économie. Et cette politique, euh, nous, le, euh, nous la considérons meilleure. Et nous ne euh, dépendrons plus euh, des, des tarifs, des politiques et des, des régulations. Je voudrais ajouter à euh, cette réponse l'élément clé dans le procès, dans le procès d'inclusion financière et, et l'avantage, l'avantage du. Euh, du des possibilités d'élever euh, les productivités. C'est pourquoi nous sommes très intéressés à cette, dans cette technologie. Vous êtes, vous êtes premier. J'ai deux questions. Un, une question pour Cambodge et la, la seconde question pour Zimbabwe et Cambodge. J'ai regardé euh, j'ai vu les rapports par le, à la Banque mondiale 2014 et 2017 en, en, dans le contexte des monnaies de, de l'argent numérique euh, les transactions euh, consistaient euh, de 2%, de, 2 de, de, de toutes les autres transactions et, and the second, uh, and, et le, la deuxième question est uh, la question de uh, crypto-monnaie, crypto l'argent numérique. Et l'acceptance au Cambodge uh, est très, très bas pour le moment. Je, je crois, je suppose que je pourrais avoir tort, mais c'est très difficile pour les technologies, euh, pour voir comment la technologie blockchain et d'autres euh, nouveautés peuvent nous aider, euh, comme dans le cas euh, Zimbabwe, avec l'autorisation et l'identification. Il euh, euh, y a des, des défis que euh, notre, nos économies euh, doivent adresser. Et la majorité des euh, pays en Afrique, par exemple, doivent euh, faire le leapfrog et utiliser cette technologie parce que euh, ça va stabiliser nos, nos, euh, nos euh, monnaies nationales. Euh, on peut puis -je, euh, répondre directement vous basez votre inclusion financière sur le rapport de la Banque mondiale. Mais l'inclusion, la, la, la stratégie de l'inclusion financière est faite par les standards et la certification. Et 
euh, et euh, l'augmentation des souscriptions par téléphone a euh, eu euh, le, le nombre est 156%. Euh, de, de la population totale euh, c'est et le, le population de, du Cambodge est très jeune et très actif il y a beaucoup de de smartphones et ceux qui travaillent dans des villes euh, ils les tarifs pour remise de l'argent sont trop hautes et les limites sont 25 dollars par transaction. Selon le groupe de travail adjoint qui travaille vers le développement le stratégie, la stratégie d'inclusion euh, on, on, on a découvert que le pourcentage euh, de la part d'inclusion est 59% c'est pourquoi notre déclaration est d'élever le niveau d'engagement de, euh, à jusqu'à 70% par rapport à 59%. C'est notre stratégie. Nous ne basons pas nos, notre stratégie euh, sur la politique de la Banque centrale. Euh, deux questions de plus à cette côté Bon, bonjour, Monsieur Modérateur. Je vous ai connu pendant plusieurs années et, euh, et je voudrais euh, remercier tous les panélistes euh, et tous les représentants du gouverneur des banques pour faire cette discussion si simple. Et par, par euh, faisant cette discussion euh, si simple, euh, Voudriez-vous euh, formuler votre euh, euh, les, les, les risques et les la, la, quelle est la peur la, la plus grande que vous voyez euh, les risques sont et, euh, les, les peurs sont évidemment évidentes. La sûreté, la sécurité. Euh, je vais passer euh, ma parole à, une, euh, à la question dernière parce que nous n'avons pas n'avons plus de temps. Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais simplement de, euh, de savoir de la part du vice-président du Cambodge, quand vos consommateurs, euh, quand vos clients ouvrent euh, des comptes dans les des banques euh, locales, qu'est-ce que ça veut faire pour, euh, en, en fonction du de, de rôle des, des institutions financières et le, le rôle d'intermédiateur euh, et, euh, et pour les consommateurs de vente de gros. Comme j'ai déjà mentionné, pour commencer, si vous avez vu ma présentation, il y a des banques, euh, la Banque centrale et d'autres institutions, euh, institutions financières. Nous avons besoin de toutes les institutions pour développer la, la confiance euh, confiance euh, dans, euh, en les euh, technologies numériques comme euh, mes collègues ont déjà mentionné aussi 
si nos clients euh, viennent euh, pour euh, ouvrir des, des comptes avec, euh, dans, dans la banque centrale, c'est directement fait. Et pour les, pour les raisons que la banque centrale contrôle tout dans le marché, euh, euh, c est, c est, il, a, il a l'assurance dans ce cas, dans son cas, parce qu'il y a l'histoire, il y a la réputation, la réputation et etc. Mais avec cette nouvelle technologie, c'est euh, rien peut euh, peut être garanti. Je voudrais, parce que nous n'avons pas plus de temps, plus de temps, euh, et je voudrais résumer notre discussion. Et euh, il y a beaucoup de potentiel et il y a beaucoup de défis dans cette nouvelle technologie. Je voudrais remercier tous tout ceux qui euh, ont participé dans cette discussion et pour vos questions aussi. Et euh, il y a eu des, des réponses positives. Et euh, nous remercions à vous tous encore une fois.